good Wednesday morning, and I'm going to do a better job at introducing myself. My name is Craig Flood, and I am your host of the John Patrick Podcast. Today, we're doing something a little different. We just kind of finished up uh, a three-part series on kind of the argument against abortion. But today, I had some friends into the studio for this episode, and they're going to talk to John about Augustine College. My friend is Mark Cummings and his son, Beck. And Beck is in the process of finishing high school, and he's thinking about what's next. He wants to go into science, and I thought, man, what better thing to invite him in to talk with John about Augustine College and what that would look like if we were to attend there, and then just general advice for him as he pursues his career. So let's go ahead and jump in. So Augustine College is a uh, liberal arts, right? Well, for want of a better term, um, I mean, the word liberal used to mean, you know, open-minded, the charitable and all the rest, and now it's become a term of... Uh, well, almost, depending on who you are, either good or bad, you know, the word has changed its meaning dramatically and there's not much we can do about it now. Uh, it, it, it is classical liberal arts, but what we tend to talk about it as is a history of culture uh, in the sense that uh, we are the product of Hebrew and Greek thought modified by the church. And that's a statement you can make and uh, people can't deny that that's what happened. They can only be angry about it, uh, which is what's happening to a large degree. And what Christians tend to have done is to put up the barricades and retreat from interaction with the world around them in any meaningful fashion. And so we got marginalised. I mean, it's true. Uh, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Dartmouth... Chicago all have one thing in common, apart from being universities. Do you know what it is? They're non-Christian? They were all Christian foundations, without exception. Evangelical. In, uh, their founders must be squirming in their graves. Uh, I mean, Jonathan Edwards uh, was a founder of Princeton. You wouldn't guess that now. So we gave up our heritage, our, our pro it was our product, and we gave it up because we were lazy. Do you know in what sense we became lazy? I guess we weren't uh, defending our faith and making, uh, spreading the gospel. Yeah, which we, which we had reduced, of course. The gospel is a big thing, a very big thing. I mean, it's in one sense, it's the history of the world, but it comes to its most obvious, what should I say, exact uh, statement in Jesus. But if we are going to be able to preach the gospel thoroughly, we need a lot more base than we have. I mean, when America was founded, particularly in Massachusetts, most pastors would have some real competence in Greek and Hebrew. When did you last have a pastor who had real competence in Greek and Hebrew and educated you each Sunday, at least in the meaning of the words you were reading? It's rare now. Uh, across the continent, the universities are closing down the classics departments and replacing them with studies programs. Now, whenever you see studies in a program, you can be pretty sure you don't want it. Um... It's a tag word, but it's always tagged to something that's more related to propaganda than it is to learning. But to give up on the languages, uh, it, it's just, it's terrifying what it implies. One of my good friends, uh, Professor Graham Hunter, uh, once showed me a letter that he'd come across. He went, he went to a little university first because he didn't like the big ones, uh, bishops in, in Quebec. And somewhere he came across a letter from a young man about you, were a little older than you. And he was writing to uh, the university saying, uh, I am competent in Latin uh, and have a working knowledge of Greek and Hebrew. I handle English, German and French. Is that sufficient for your college? That was 100 years ago when somebody would write... A, something like, is that sufficient for your college? Now, if somebody saw that on the uh, admission slip, they'd say, well, we don't know what to do with you. 
And the youngest person to take our course at Augustine was 15, but she was competent in Latin, Greek, and had a, some knowledge of Hebrew. Uh, we have opened the doors to education because we have an elite who can't bear to recognize that not everybody is meant for university and university is not meant for everybody. Uh, they do a lot of damage. I mean, all the dam most of the damage in the world has been done by people who thought of themselves as clever and in many ways they were. Uh, so to that degree, uh, we ought always to beware. I mean, when I set off for university, the last thing my mum said to me as I went out the door to go off to London, um, she said, beware of philosophers. Uh, she was quoting St. Paul of thought, of course. And of course, the first thing I did was take a course in philosophy. Uh, but she basically right. Uh, they think their ideas are more important than reality. In, Aristotle was one of the smartest men who ever lived. Uh, incredible what he did in terms of the development of logic and learning and classification and all the rest. But he was arrogant to a degree, or maybe arrogant is the wrong word. He made a huge mistake. He didn't bother to check what he thought. He was so enamoured of his own mind, I guess, that when he'd made up his mind how things were, that's the way it was. So he ruined physics for a, a millennium and a half because he, everything had to be perfect circles and things fell in, in proportion to their weight. The, a trip to the nearest cliff with a couple of stones, a big one, a little one would have told him that he was wrong, but nobody did that for 1,500 years. Or at least if they did it, they, they, they were too frightened to say so. And when Galileo made his first telescope, which was an improvement on the Dutch one, and took it to the Jesuits to look at the fact that uh, Aristotle got the stars wrong too, they were not perfect at all, I mean, the, the planets. And one of the Jesuits said, Nothing that I can see through this machine will change uh, the divine Aristotle. I mean, that's commitment to your way of looking at the world in a way that's ridiculous to us now. It wasn't then. So one of the most important things you need to be thinking about before you go off into science, um, you will be turned into somebody who practiced scientism if you haven't done some work beforehand. What's scientism? Uh, scientism is the belief that science can solve all the questions. The COVID uh, phenomenon was a good example of that. It was so brutally mismanaged and they're still trying to defend themselves from what they did. Three guys, uh, uh, no, sorry, two guys and a woman, um, one from Harvard, uh, who is no, from Massachusetts, I think he's Harvard, uh, but originally from Sweden, a woman from Oxford, and Joe Bhattacharya from Stanford, got it right, right at the beginning, and they were all first-class epidemiologists, uh, well recognised, and they were cancelled. Uh, they said, it's a coronavirus, we know enough about co co coronaviruses, and we do, uh, to know that we will not stop their spread. They, they will spread and we will acquire immunity eventually. What we ought to do is move the most vulnerable people into a sheltered environment and let everyone else get on with their lives. Only Sweden did it. No lockdowns, uh, no closing the schools. Children did not have to wear masks. Initially, of course, they had some initial mortalities which put them higher than all the other Scandinavian countries who waved their finger at them. Now, they've got better figures than they did, and certainly not worse. And of course, no children who didn't get any real education for two years. How do you expect children to learn to speak well if they can't see how people are moving their lips? It's ridiculous. And so on. But what was the, the thing the government said all the while? The science is in. The science is never in. Science is always provisional. That's what makes it exciting. You don't know what you're going to discover next week. And it may t take down what you've been saying for years. It, that's what happens when big changes occur. So, uh, 
if you don't want to move into a group that has something like a 70% uh, probability of not coming to church after you finish university, then you'd be well advised to take a gap year, uh, not to play around, but to fill in those educational blanks that are there at the moment. Um, let me... You, you're, you're good. I, obviously, you don't mind being questioned, and you know how to say, I don't know. That's an incredible step forward. So many people can't say, I don't know. Um, whenever I was on the other side of the green beige table, as it used to be, looking at a potential uh, doctor, uh, the one thing I wanted to hear him say at that stage is, I don't know. And in fact, if I had the privilege, which I did, every now and again, of doing the first clinical rounds with a group of students, uh, or the first time they came across me anyway, I'd still do it. I would not tell them before I started, but no one was allowed to leave the round until they'd said, I don't know. So some of the more honest ones got to go fairly quickly and said, you've done enough for today, off you go. Um, and the bright ones who thought they should have been let off first took quite a while to realize they had to say, I don't know. Uh, there's no place for intellectual arrogance at the bedside. Uh, I remember the person who taught that to me, he was not that much older than me, and I've forgotten his name, and I would love to thank him, but uh, I was an arrogant little brat, uh, and he realized it. But he also knew that God had made me reasonably smart. And he said, the bed, the bedside is no place for intellectual arrogance. And I was smart enough to realize, realize he was right and, and try and do something about it. Uh, I, unlike you, I imagine, uh, even though you, you, you've probably been, have you been homeschooled yeah, been or homeschooled. classical schooled or what? Yeah. Homeschooled. It's one of the best ways to start. Um but uh, the thing that you need, that you, you have got some degree from that, but not enough, I, I want to try and get you to get to it without me making the, the statement, so to speak, because th then it will be yours, not mine. How do you know that you're good at something? Maybe when you've got mastery of it, uh, when you're able to understand and then take that understanding and apply it. Yeah, that's that. That's pretty good. Um, is that sufficient? That 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 will allow you to check the boxes, won't it? In the kinds of things we call examinations now, where you don't write a sentence. How are you going to realize that there's another layer above that? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Any ideas? Maybe if you can, maybe go teach other people about it. That's another level of mastery. If you can. Uh, well, yes, if you, it, it's good if the teacher knows a bit more than the student. But if you don't meet people who are an order of magnitude better than you are, you have missed out. That's the best thing that can happen to you when you meet someone who's a decent human being and light years better than you are. I've had three or four conversations with Nobel Prize winners for one reason or another. Uh, that is a privilege. Some of them uh, that I know of indirectly uh, can only talk about their subject, but most of them, of course, are incredibly smart. And when you talk to them, that's what you get. You get the beginnings of uh, a recognition of just how big the stretch is, and it's absolutely huge. And that creates the kind of humility you want. That's what our Lord should do to us, but doesn't. I mean, you rarely hear in church, can you imagine anybody else saying what he has just done? And the answer, of course, is no, we can't, because we wouldn't do it. And he never showed off, did he? Uh, you need higher standards. Now, one of the ways you can get to it in language is very simple. Uh, do you have a quotation book? No. Or, or commonplace? Oh, you know, I do. Yeah, I have a quotation book. As such, uh, or is it 
just part of your learning, so to speak? Is it treasured? Obviously, it's not treasured because uh, yet, because you had to be reminded that you had something that yeah, might no. be called that. Um, and it it's probably typed. You being a modern person, it come it's on your computer or something. I actually sort. handwrite it. Good, that's a great step forward. Um, I don't have my copy. I always carry one, and when I hear something said well, I write it down. Or when I read something that's said well, I write it down. When you hear something said in a way that, that's just too good for you, the only excuse you have for not learning it is laziness. But if you do write it down, then you begin to develop standards that you hadn't had before. Uh, my favorite line in poetry about what being a Christian is like uh, is from Gerard Manley Hopkins, and he says this, Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes, not his, to the Father through the features of men's faces. I love that metaphor, that I can think of myself in this life as being rather like my grandchildren, of whom I have 22. Uh, when they all appeared at the farm, or a large number of them, when they were young, one of the things I enjoyed most was just watching them play when they were in a good mood and playing well. And always that line would come into my mind. That is what God wants from us. He wants us to see us playing well. Um, best science comes out of that. You don't know where you're going. What I... I used to say when I was doing uh, science, I stopped doing it about 25 years ago now, uh, but I said I I played with very expensive Lego and then managed to persuade the people with money that they should give me some more. Um, that's what you do as a, as a scientist. And technologist is trying to do what people know is in principle possible. That's the huge difference. The scientist doesn't know where he's going. Uh, and that's the joy of it. And every now and again, you see something, uh, if you're blessed, uh, that is important. Uh, see is the right verb to use. You didn't work it out. It wasn't a result of blood, sweat and tears, although that, those were necessarily part of it. But it was a, a moment of insight. And we haven't done a good job in giving uh, young people in church any sense that we we own that heritage to a very large degree. Um, let me tell you a very brief biography of a man whose name you know, uh, but I'd be delighted if you recognize it and you can just wave your hand to stop me as soon as you know who it is, or you can just say it. Uh, he was born in London to a very poor family. His father was a blacksmith. And what education he had was largely in his church, where he was uh, not only every Sunday several times, but during the week as well. Um, by the time he was 12, I think it was, around that age, he was already at work as an apprentice bookbinder in London. Fortunately for him, uh, his boss uh, was a good man, and he realized this boy was smart. Uh, so he said, you know, you can read the books you're binding uh, when you take a break. And he was binding a lot of scientific books. So he started to read them, became interested. Now, one of the advantages of being in London is that in those days there were free public lectures, uh, particularly on science. So he went along to the Royal Institute and occasionally the Royal Society to lectures on science. And he loved them. And he took excellent notes, which we still have. I didn't see that. I have never handled them myself, but I didn't even see them till about a year ago on YouTube. I found them. Um... And uh, 
by the time he was your age, he was thinking about what comes next. I see you haven't got there yet. And your dad's not to tell you if he gets there because it's your question. Um, he knew that he didn't want to spend his life binding books. His imagination only stretched as far as thinking he might be able to get a job as the tech, the technician who set up the experiments to go with the lectures at the Royal Institute, the Royal Society. And so he bound his treasured notes, at least he bound some of them, uh, which he could do very well, entrusted them to the post and sent them to the president of the Royal Institute, who fortunately for him was a good Christian man. Uh, he didn't toss the young man's work into the garbage. I imagine the binding was excellent and that intrigued him. But what intrigued him more was the quality of the notes. With a few hiccups, he got the job that he wanted. Uh, it needed a little divine uh, help in getting rid of the guy who had the job to begin with. Uh, very shortly, he became indispensable. The, the great scientists of the day would go through London and they would meet his boss and meet him, and they knew in the scientific world. There was a very smart young man in London who'd never been to high school, let alone university. Eventually, he became president of the Royal Institute. Uh, he turned down the Royal Society a couple of times on the grounds that he was too busy. Uh, he, However, he was known to stop the committee meetings at the Royal Institute so that he could go to his prayer meeting. Who, who is he? I can't think of a... I can't r remember... If I learned it. Well, you would remember if you'd learned it so you didn't learn it. <laughs> His name is Michael Faraday, who is so important that he has an international unit named after him, the Farad. And if it hadn't been for Faraday, Clark Maxwell would not have did, done what he did. And if Clark Maxwell hadn't done what he did, Einstein would not have been able to do what he did. Now, this sequence of scientists has something in common. Copernicus, Kepler, Newton, Boyle, Faraday, Maxwell... Eddington, apart from being physicists, they have one other thing in common. You should be able to guess what it is. They were all Christian. They were. And four of them were devoutly evangelical. We don't produce people like that. Now, John Lennox is an exception, but there are many John Lennoxes around, are there? Have you listened to him? No, I don't. Look him up on YouTube. Professor of Mathematics from... Uh, Oxford, who took Dawkins down twice and he stopped trying to argue for atheism. Uh, another very smart man from the same bit of the world as C.S. Lewis. You can see what I'm getting at. Uh, in the Augustine course, we teach the history of science and uh, medicine, and mathematics, uh, art, literature, uh, theology, philosophy. Um, over an eight-month period. Obviously, it's a very broad brush approach. And uh, certainly in my bit of the course, I uh, am absolutely convinced that, uh, yes, I, I'm there to introduce you to people. I, I have to do it by narrative because so many of your generation are now terrified of anything that might look like an equation. So there's no point in doing that. We get people who tend to be on the arty end because especially the boys who are looking at technology and science, they're in such a hurry that they end up with diminished souls as a result of the process. It's not a good idea. Um, yeah, you should come take our course. Uh, you would enjoy it. Uh, you'd meet some people with whom you become friends for the rest of your life. Uh, unfortunately, this year the course is rather short on students, so it's going to be very much uh, tutoring. We were stopped for one year by COVID and we're slowly recovering, but we've been going since the first group graduated in uh, 98. And the founders of whom I was one, uh, none of us wanted to do it. So I'll tell you the story and then you will at least, I think, see that this is something God did, not us. Um, I came to Canada in 1980 or thereabout, I think 1980, uh, having uh, been in 
England, in London, and then done seven years in Jamaica, uh, working with a wonderful for the Wellcome Trust, the world's best employers. And I uh, was privileged to be part of a small group of people who actually ended up writing the definitive protocols for the uh, treatment of severely malnourished children. I was interested in what happens to the biochemical metabolism of children who are 10 pound two year olds when you and how you could bring them back to life. Uh, when the unit where the, I did this work uh, had been running for some uh, 15 years before I got there, I was there for the last seven and had the privilege of putting the last piece in the puzzle. Uh, but those children, 10 pound two year olds or worse, was the condition for getting into the unit. When the unit opened, they had a 50% mortality rate. Uh, it had come down to about 25% when I got there, and we got the last stretch done over a seven-year period, about, uh, about a dozen of us working on the project at the time. It's a wonderful privilege to be allowed to do that. Um, and then when that came to an end, uh, Mrs. Satcher cancelled the job I was supposed to have in London, and so... Uh, uh, I got two offers, one in the States, which I refused, and it was Harvard, uh, and it was so uncivilized I couldn't work there. People were so competitive, there was no collegiality. Ottawa was perfect because it was old-fashioned. My kids could walk the streets, I have three daughters and a son, and uh, they went to the local university first because it was free, because I taught there, and they could walk home nine o'clock at night for 20 minutes with no worries. I mean, it was literally 50 years behind the times, and that was wonderful. Unfortunately, the times are catching up with it now. Uh, in the, the Prime Minister, when we arrived, used to walk from the Prime Minister's house to Parliament 10 minutes every morning, no security, saying good morning to people, talking to them on the way. That too was gone. The world is not getting better. Uh, you know that, particularly in the States. So... Uh, uh, I had to start earning my living uh, as a traditional science, as a traditional professor and giving lectures. Now, I'd never had a handout in my life during my education. I had a wonderful education, but nobody gave handouts. They expected you to listen and engage and read, uh, which is the way I learned. Um, so I gave my first lecture and half the students wanted me fired and the other half wanted more. So the dean had a little chat with me and said, you have to give handouts. So I protested that that was spoon feeding. And he said, that's what we have to do now. Um, and so I had to give handouts. And the teaching biochemistry to medical students is the best description I know of a waste of time. Uh, because biochemistry is like learning a new language. You don't learn a new language in 10 minutes. But So I, I would tell the students, look, those people who think they know about education say you need to understand the basics of biochemistry, except for a, a few genii, that's impossible in the time allowed. Um, so be cynical, go and look at the stupid questions they ask you to answer. There'll all be multiple guess, so you can even do it statistically. I taught them to be cynical, really, about learning, which is sad. Um, but uh, one of the students in the class a year or so in, heard me give a very cynical lecture in Ottawa about, for Christians actually, uh, for InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, for their annual dinner, and the guy persuaded me to do it. I said, I'm not going to raise any money for you. He said, no, they need to hear what you've got to say though. And uh, I talked about the fact that most evangelical Christians in particular don't come through university with their faith intact because they're not prepared for the battle they have to fight. Um, I don't... Obviously, it wasn't the kind of lecture where you get lots of delightful comments afterwards, but um, some weeks later, in the audits, there was a young man who just got into our medical school. And after hearing me, I wasn't known as being student-friendly. He plucked up his courage and knocked on my door. And I said, invited him in and said, what can I do for you? And he said, are you actually a Christian? I said, well, it's a fair question. And I acknowledge there's not too much evidence in public. You have to come to my home to see that it does actually matter to us. But um, why are you asking? He said, well, 
I was at that lecture you gave in Ottawa where you said, I'm highly likely not to have an active faith when I become a doctor, by the time I become a doctor. And he said, there are four of us in first year who don't want to do that. Will you help us? And I said, what would, what would you want me to do? He said, well, could you do some Bible studies to help us integrate faith and practice? I knew I could. I was about to say no when my mother turned up at the back of my head and said, you could do that. You ought to do that. So instead of no, I said, I think if you came to my house, we could do some Bible studies. Uh, so you better come at eight o'clock at night so that you've done some study beforehand and you're not neurotic and we'll see where it goes. I'll do four weeks. I ended up doing 10 years. And step by step, I was moved from my wonderful ivory tower uh, so that I actually retired from the university a couple of years early because you Americans had got on my case. Um, the next thing that happened in that sequence was uh, the Faculty of Education, which I would blow up if I could. I'd take the people out, but if we could... If I could do one thing for education in America, it would be to totally destroy any idea that it's possible to teach people how to teach because it's not teachable. It's a combination of two gifts, and you can find it in 1 Timothy 3 if you want to see what the two gifts are, and I won't tell you. You can write to me if you desperately need to know the answer at some point. Um and our faculty of education sent a missive around the university saying that teaching should be from a morally neutral position. It sounds very nice to modern students who think that tolerance is a virtue, which it isn't. Uh, I was so angry, steam was rising, so I sat down at my computer and for the first time in my life I wrote something about my faith. Uh, not, it wasn't a personal thing, it was an attack on the concept of moral neutrality. Uh, it was called The Myth of Moral Neutrality, and in about three hours I'd done it, and I felt better. I didn't have to look anything up. It all came. It was a gift, in a way. Uh, only a dozen pages or so. Um, and I sent it to a friend to read. Uh, he was an Irishman by origin, and uh, the editor of the a magazine for evangelical Christian doctors in Canada. I only published, what, four times a year, and a couple of thousand copies. And I didn't send it to him to publish. I said, I want your comments. He wrote back, I'm publishing it. I said, it hasn't even been through a spell check. He said, I don't care. It has passion. The guys will like it. I guess it was a summer edition. And uh, when it rained and you're at the cottage, you've got to read something. And I came shortly above the cereal box, I think, basically. But it, it was read. Now, I... I've got what I now call a curriculum vanitas. They don't read it, they weigh it. Um, but that little paper published in, in a very obscure journal that is not on anybody's list went round the world. And it's had more impact on my career than things published in the major scientific peer-reviewed literature. Uh, perhaps that's a slight overstatement, but not much. Um... And a little while after it was published, I got a call from the States uh, when I'd uh, come to terms with it. It turned out it was the uh, director of the Christian Medical Dental Association of the US who'd been a missionary doctor in Kenya for nearly 20 years, taken a one-man hospital and turned it to the best teaching hospital in Kenya uh, in that time. A wonderful entrepreneur, uh, a very smart man, but... He'd been so tunnel visioned, he'd gone the quickest way to being a missionary doctor, which didn't give him the education he should have had. But he was persuaded to come back and run the CMDA because they knew they needed to become something more than a fellowship group, which is what they were. And he said, I just listened to a tape of yours six times. I don't normally do that. And I said, can't be me. Don't make tapes. He said, it's your voice. Couldn't argue with that. And I said, what's it called? He said, the myth of moral neutrality. I said, oh, I've written a short paper in an obscure journal on that, but 
he said, you made a tape, but it, it's an amateur one. You pro probably don't know where it was recorded. And I don't. I didn't even know I'd given the talk. Um, but I couldn't argue with the evidence. Uh, he said, I need a good copy uh, to send to American physicians. So will you come and record it in the States? I don't have a travel budget, he said, we'll pay. I said, oh, you don't, well, apart from travel costs, you don't need to pay. He said, I, we want to pay you because we think we're going to use you. Uh, somebody warned me, the Americans will take you over, you know. I said, no, they won't bother. They'll soon get over it. So I came to the States and recorded four talks. Now, my wife was in Africa at that point. That's another whole story. And so she, she was away from home a bit. And when she left, I was giving six talks a year on Christian things in the Ottawa area. By the time she got back, I was doing approaching 100 all over the continent. And my life had changed. Now, one of the other things that happened at this time was that I realized that most doctors go through very long periods in which they have no subjective sense of Christ in their life, either from reading the Bible, prayer, the Lord's Supper, fellowship. You never heard a doctor get up in church when you ask for prayer needs and say, my soul is in the depths, because they know nobody would believe them and they'd be shocked. So they don't. But ordinary doctors will... When you sit them down and say, come on, what's the longest period you didn't open your Bible and prayer was dead? And they'll say weeks. If they're academics, it can get to years. In my case, it was nearly 10. Uh, that's the truth. And we don't talk about it. But when we look at the, the Bible, it's full of things like that. I mean, God thinks, he says to Abraham, uh, oh, you're going to die at a ripe old age, but your kids are all going to be slaves in Egypt for four centuries. And Abraham says, thank you. Um, I mean, we, we don't read the story and say, what's God up to? Well, whatever he's up to, his time scale is not ours. Uh, he doesn't care what he does because he is a utilitarian. He, he desires our ultimate good and he will do whatever is necessary to get us there if we've got enough willingness to go. But don't expect it to be easy. He tells you. They'll beat you up. They'll throw you out of the synagogue. They'll, they'll do to you what they did to me. And then he says, rejoice. Which means that rejoicing is not a feeling. And yet you go to church on Sunday morning to feel good. You can't find that in the Bible. You go to church to think good. And when you do, you feel terrible because you realize you're not a very good disciple. And when you begin to be obedient, that changes. Uh, Fortunately, I'd come across Bonhoeffer's comment that when you're in, in a low patch in your life, ask God to give you a passage of Scripture from him to you in a personal way. Uh, just add it to your prayers. Ask for that gift, and he will answer it. Uh, just pay attention. And some weeks or months later, I am time to tell you the story now because there are other things we ought to do first, uh, but... The Sermon on the Mount, not, not a few verses, but three chapters was dropped into my lap as my text. and I've been reading it, it for years now. It comes into my uh, life at some point almost every 24 hours, and it's still growing because we don't have the Sermon on the Mount in the Bible. We only have the lecture notes for the Sermon on the Mount. They're brilliant notes. But anybody who's taught can see it. Those are aphorisms. They've got to be developed. That can't be left hanging like that. But, of course, God knows what he's doing. He can be left hanging like that. And it bears fruit in his time and in his way. Um, if you don't have a text in your life, it's one of the things you can put it on your prayer list and get it. Uh, and it will change you. Now, what happened with that was that... Um, I can't fill in the details too long, but... It resulted in the beginning of the college and me discovering that there were other Christians in the university who were in the same state as I was and had the same beliefs. And uh, We found in very short order, actually, I met a philosopher first and then uh, one of the guys I think is the best evangelical intellect on the continent at the moment who's just retired from... Uh, from uh, Texas, Baylor, uh, David, David Jeffries, 
David Jeffrey actually. Uh, then uh, the classicists did later. And John Paul II was canon lawyer was at the university. We had half a dozen uh, Christian profs, senior profs, all of whom had uh, unassailable CVs, as you say, and yet we were all Christian. We didn't know one another. And we'd all watched young people like you arrive at university. And when I'm in a particular cynical mood, I would say, we watch them lose their mind, their virginity, and their faith in random order in the first year. That's what's happening these days. And most of the young people going to university have no idea what they want to do. Do, ha do not have a love of learning because they, they sign up for courses and don't even bother to read anything about the course before they sign up. They just like the idea. It feels nice. Whenever you hear the verb feel, especially in church or in the university, how do you really mean think? And that changes the whole conversation. So we started reading together, because we didn't know what to do about these students. And going to Bible school actually made it worse, more likely that you'd lose those characteristics, because you come from Bible school and you quote scripture as though everybody acknowledges its authority, and they don't. And uh, the one thing academics are good at is language, and they can take you to pieces by deceit. Tom Sowell always points this out. I don't know what Tom Sowell believes, but he's certainly worth reading. Uh, so we decided we would read everything we could find on the nature of education from the Greeks to Alistair MacIntyre in the 20th century. And by the end of it, we knew what you needed. Uh, you needed history. You're not taught history anymore, certainly not well. You need to know where you come from. You need to have the heroes of the faith in your mind. Uh, I was blessed to grow, never have a, a screen in my hand when I was at school. We didn't even have a television. We didn't have a car. Uh, we were technically poor, but I didn't know that because I was loved and my parents were deeply devoted to Christ. And I was always loved, fed, clothed. What more could a kid want? And of course, in those days, we didn't worry about child safety. By the time I was your age, I had ridden my bicycle all the way to Vienna and back and all over Europe in the summers. And all I had to do was send a postcard every day because it would get back to Birmingham in 48 hours from anywhere on the continent in those days. In England, you could post a, a card in a city at nine o'clock in the morning. It would de be delivered by midday. That has all changed now. So I had a wonderful childhood without knowing how wonderful it was. And then beginning to talk to the students and realize they were affluent, they had more things, uh, more toys, but no joy of learning. And we were persuaded by homeschooling moms and dads and graduate students that we had to start a course. We said we can't do that because the feminists certainly won't allow it because if you teach a history of ideas honestly, there'll be three women in it. Not because they couldn't have done, but because the way the world was structured didn't give them an opportunity. And they don't even know the people who should be their own heroes. Byron's daughter, for instance, wrote the first code. But that the feminists don't even know that or didn't. So they're beginning now because they're looking for heroes. and They have to come to us to tell them who they are. Uh, but normally if I, uh, I'm in that situation and somebody asks me, which, which they will in any liberal university, which women appear in your course, and I, I'm not going to be caught on that one. I say, well, I'm just a humble scientist. I wish I was, but uh, uh, both, both of them are untrue. Um, but uh, I approximate. Uh, I would say, so you tell me the women who should appear in my bit of the course, which is the history of science and medicine. And of course, I get Hildegard of Bingen and Marie Curie, followed by Hildegard of Bingen, followed by Marie Curie. They only know two. I'm not going to tell them who the others are. I say, well, I think you could find a few more. And they're totally embarrassed, and I don't have to answer the question. And that's the key for you. Uh, if you're a Christian, you better start practicing now. You need to learn to ask questions. 
Who was the world's greatest questioner? Jesus. Eliot somewhere has a wonderful line, Beware of him who knows how to ask questions. The Holy Spirit, uh, the Trinity. Uh, the best modern version is Peter Kraft. If you haven't read any Kraft, you should, before you go to university. The best things in life uh, you could start with. It's written as dialogue. If you've got other teenagers at your stage, you could put it on in your church as a skit. The last chapter, 35 pages, double space. He doesn't mind you photocopying it, I asked him. Uh, and it's a dialogue between an imagined Socrates arriving at Desperate State University and meeting a, two people, a young man who's technically orientated, who once doesn't realise he's on a circular view of life. Uh, Socrates asks him why he's working so hard at his studies. He says, well, I want to get a good degree to get a good job so that I, when I marry, I can look after my children properly. All very well, said uh, Socrates, but why do you need a big house and two cars and a swimming pool? How's that going to advantage your children? And he takes his world apart and shows him, look, you've left out all the big things. The other one, the girl, is just having a party. And he takes her world apart in 35 pages in the last chapter and replaces it with a better one without making a statement. That's what you have to learn to do. If they get to a question they can't answer, say, well, you need to go away and think about that, don't you? You don't need to open yourself up to unnecessary uh, dialogue, which is only concerned to bring you down. You can see what happens, and you can be good at it, like Ben Shapiro, or, uh, some of the others, uh, Jordan Peterson, Douglas Murray is probably the best, but there are people out there who do it. John Lennox does it beautifully. Uh, but that's a special skill, and you don't need it. Most people couldn't do it anyway but you can learn what the questions are. Um, I've already talked to you for about 50 minutes. We better be careful. Um, what are the turning points? That about, uh, all these things happened in about a space of three or four years. I was turned from being a, an ivory tower researcher who the dean left alone because I published papers and I brought money into the university. If you do that, you can do anything. You can say no. Uh, I never turned up for committees. Nobody complained. Uh, I was a pain in the neck if I did turn up, so they were happy that I didn't. Um, and that all changed over a space of years. And students came into our home. When you allow people into your home, you start to like them, then love them, and then they wreck your life. Well, not really. They made it for me. But at about this time, I was asked to give a lecture at McGill uh, on medical ethics. And at the end, I said, well, the bottom line as a starter is that you must be able to answer the following questions. Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? How do I make sense of death, of suffering and injustice? What can I know so that I know what I ought to believe? There are some things you ought to believe because you have to make a choice and you have to make the best one available to you so that I may know how I ought to live. That should keep you going for a bit, end of my lecture. When I got back to Ottawa, there were several emails saying, where did those questions come from? Of course, the answer is we don't know because they were written down as soon as writing began some, well, yeah, depending on what you call writing, three to five centuries before Christ. And almost the first writing that we have contains those questions in some form or another. They've been around a very long time, so nobody can take credit for them. They're written on the heart, I think, by God. Read George Grant on technology and justice. And look, if you want to take a gap year, you would enjoy it now rather than giving your mum and dad a break from homeschooling. You won't be... You, you'd manage it, I can tell them, because you have the right attitude. So we start in September. I'm serious, you could do that. The, uh, we, it's, we haven't got back to normal numbers. We've only got small numbers. We can handle it easily. And it's not that expensive for your dad. He can do a bit more engineering <laughs> and you'll, you'll be fine. It, it's a lot cheaper than any university in the United States. And the, there are places beginning to who will take our students if you're good. And if you're not good, you shouldn't go to university. As well as getting rid of the Faculty of Education, we should cut down university entrance to at least 
50% of what it is at the moment. And it should be entirely based on academic ability. Uh, Jordan Peterson's right. If you want one thing, do the IQ test. It's crude, but it works. He's good. But it doesn't allow affirmative action. He's good. Yeah. That's very good. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, uh, the people who take our course, uh, we produce 10% of them end up as doctors. We've been going only 25 years. We have at least four professors now, multiple PhDs. I've lost count of masters. But most importantly, there's a temp- this won't apply to you. You're too young. Uh, but there's always older students coming along as well who are in the university system and realize they need help. Uh, and they have a 50% probability of finding their spouse while they're with us. Sorry, 10% probability. I must never say that. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, it's been the pedagogic joy of my life. Um, and students will typically say something like this when I meet them later and we're having a conversation with people around. And I'll say to them, tell these folk what you thought of the program. And they'll say something like this. One of them said it beautifully. She now has her own program at Johns Hopkins. Uh, she said, I had many years of so-called higher education but nothing came close to the eight months of Augustine. It gives you a foundation to stand on, and everybody needs that, particularly today. So, go in peace, to love and fear the Lord. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed that episode. We really do appreciate you guys listening, and I would encourage you, if you enjoy this podcast, share it with a friend, post it in a Facebook group, share it with anybody who you think could benefit from it. I was really happy the day that somebody shared John Patrick with me, and you could be that for somebody else. So thank you all again, and we will see you guys next week.